Hey Chicago, what do you say? It's the CHGO Cubs podcast. It is a cold January 16th in Chicago. Deep freeze is still here. What are they called? Arctic blast? Polar vortex? Yeah, I am I am craving a 20 degree weather day. <laughs> it would feel so good right uh, now. It would be such a heat wave. That and a car wash. Those two things oh, I'm looking yeah. forward to. My car to. needs it so bad. <laughs> I have a red Mitsubishi Lancer and it, it it's white right now. Like it needs it needs a car wash in the biggest way. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about on the podcast today. Hello to everybody in the live YouTube chat, which is the best way to enjoy the CHGO Cubs experience. Sign up for the CHGO Sports YouTube page so you don't miss any of our shows. Then give it the full you know the full work, the, the likes, the hearts, the thumbs up, the positive reviews, all those good things. We even got uh, a down, uh, thumbs down already. So yeah, thanks. appreciate that as well. Always in some in some weird way, I appreciate. We'll you. get to the bottom of it. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure out who it is. Uh, Luke Stuckmar, Cody Del Mendo, and Ryan Herrera with you today. Uh, part of our show will also include the great Jared Willis. As uh, if you've read the caption here, we are going to sit down. It's our first of the Cubs convention interviews that we did. So we're going to a lot of this podcast will be our conversation with Mike Talkman. We're going to talk Talkman. In between parts of that interview, he was great. He was gracious with his time. He was a lot of fun. Um, and we're also going to talk about the Cubs bullpen. I will say this right out of the gate. If you're wondering before we get to the Talkman interview, we did not mention the summer of Mike Talkman. Rumor is he might not think it's the greatest thing in the world. And so we just left it out. We, we, just, we had a good time. We talked about things. Uh, there is a little bit of Arlington Heights talk in there, but not, but not a lot. Yeah, we did talk a little bears with him even as well. Uh, <laughs> Which we teased on our Twitter account and yeah. Instagram account. So. He's got a take on oh, yeah. he's got a take on the field situation, like every Bears fan. Uh, so anyways, stick around for that. That's coming up in just a couple minutes. The interview with Mike Talkman is a lot of fun. But here in the first segment, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the other stuff that was discussed at Cubs convention. One of the keys being the bullpen, right? Mm -hmm. Like Jed Hoyer admitted right out of the gate, it, it was basically our Achilles at the end of the season. Now, whether that was the bullpen's fault, whether that was Hoyer's fault because the bullpen wasn't strong enough or deep enough, or whether that was David Ross's fault for running them into the ground. Maybe it was a combination of all three things kind of uh, combining to do one thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, basically Hoyer was... Quoted as saying, it's a hard area. There's a lot of ways to skin the bullpen cat, but we do need to focus on it. It was an Achilles heel last year for sure. Now, he's also talking about multi-year deals, guys. He's talking about multi-year free agent deals for relievers. I'm on record as saying there is, there is no harder thing to figure out in baseball. Yes, you can have one reliever like Hayter who's good almost every year mm -hmm. or Kimbrell up to a certain point every year or Mariano Rivera. But guys that were good in the bullpen one year, it's a 50-50 roll of the dice whether they're going to be good the next year. That's just the yeah. reality of it. Yeah. No, yeah, like you mentioned, like he was asked about the, the quote. Because he, he had said earlier, like we talked to him the Friday of Cubs convention, he had said earlier um, that he did want to – you know, continue adding to the bullpen. Um, you look at it, and it, it's the same names, right? I guess they added Almonte in that Dodgers deal, but he had a he had a rough year in in LA with the Dodgers, so it wasn't like a huge addition to this bullpen right now. It, it could end up working out. Maybe they, they get him in the pitch lab or something. But um, the bullpen is kind of in the same spot where it was this past season. Um, so he did mention wanting to add to the bullpen, and later on was asked, you know, something. Um, you know, is is adding an established veteran, uh, um, even on a multi-year deal, like is that something they're looking at? And and you know, Jet has kind of, and even in the quote he gave us, kind of went like, "That's not my favorite thing to do. I don't love giving multi-year deals for relievers for the reason right. you're saying, right? 
re- relievers and just bullpens in general are, are the most volatile part of baseball because it's a hard job to be a reliever. It's a hard job to, to do what a lot of those guys do, especially when you're a closer or, or uh, you know, long relievers, right? Like that, there was that, uh, that, that quote that Mark Leiter Jr. gave um, back talking about Javier Assad and what he was doing, but um, kind of mentioned the, the, his role as a reliever at that point. Um, no, yeah, it, it's tough. And so giving multi-year deals is not something that this front office is – doesn't love to do and I don't blame them for those reasons however they are they they have to look at ways that they can build upon this bullpen and you know like we've mentioned the name Josh Hader before and and I still say here and I don't and I don't see it I don't think it's it's the route that the Cubs are going to go at this moment I don't see it but um, if they were to want to go and get Josh Hader, like that's going to be a multi-year deal, right? Like that, they're, they're not going to be able to get him on a one-year deal unless they're paying him a ton of money. And even then, he's probably a guy that wants to get a multi-year deal, get some security. So, um, he did. He did admit Hoyer did admit that they have offered some multi-year yeah. deals to relievers this offseason. Yeah, yeah, and 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 clearly none of them have been accepted. <laughs> like he's accepted. No, yeah. No, so you don't know what exactly those offers are, but. Um, th- I think just the overall point is that he – and he has met, he has talked about this during the season. He talked about it after, at the end of the season, that he understands the hand he dealt the team with with not addressing the bullpen enough, so to speak. And so, like, going into this offseason and through this winter, Jed knows that the bullpen is an area that needs to be addressed. He called it the – like, it was an Achilles heel last year. And, and for a long time it wasn't, right? For a long time last year it wasn't. But at the end of the season, when usage and injuries started catching up to guys, it, it did become that. So, um, yeah, Jed knows that he needs to address it. And it's possible that going up with a multi-year deal is is the way that he feels he needs to address it. Again, I don't, I don't know what the percentages I would put on that are. It still feels a little lower, again, just because that they don't love doing that. But if that's what they need to do to improve the bullpen and make sure the kind of um, – fall that it had, I guess, in September it doesn't happen again. That might be what they need to do, and, and, and they'll do it. So, yeah. I am uh, I go back and forth with this, right, because obviously this bullpen would be incredible if they had Josh, if they added Josh Hader. Um, at the same time, with Cody Bellinger still on the market, I don't want the Cubs to spend that kind of money on a closer, a guy who's going to pitch the ninth inning, when Cody Bellinger is going to make a much bigger impact on this team going forward, in my opinion. So I I don't think the Cubs will sign a guy like Hayter before Bellinger. Uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not against signing a guy like Josh Hayter. It's more about just how the Cubs are going to spend this cash. And I'm not just thinking about this year. I'm thinking about next year, too. I'm thinking about next offseason. I'm thinking about the offseason, about that when it comes to this. And listen, I've sat here and defended front office a lot, defended ownership a lot in the last couple of years just because I've bought in on the direction after the trade deadline of 2021. But I'm not going to sit here with a blind eye. Like, the Cubs are not acting like the Mets. They're not acting like the Padres. They're not acting like the Rangers. If you want to spin it to the good side, they just aren't. And so... When I put that into perspective, them spending all this money on a guy like Josh Hader just doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense whenever you still you need honestly, to me, the offense is the reason that they, that they did not make the playoffs last year. Yes, the bullpen collapsed in its own way, but that was because of injury. We for, everyone forgot that Alzali was hurt the entire month of September. Michael Fulmer got hurt in September. Like they were using Jose Quas every single day. They didn't give Luke Little, any chance at all, unless they were up by a thousand runs or not. Like there, there were they did they didn't use they used like the same guys every single day. They were in a close game every single day. It felt like in September. So to me, and I've said this all off season, that they just need to add depth and then incorporate some of these guys they have on the farm that are going to debut. I know a lot of us in the chat probably, and and I've said this myself. I'm high on Luke Little going into next year. He's going to get a much. He's probably going to get a, a much bigger opportunity to contribute in the bullpen, right? But you still got to sign at least 
at least one more veteran reliever, in my opinion. You added Almonte, and I know he wasn't very good with the Dodgers last year, but in 2022, he was pretty right. good, right? He's been in big game situations pitching for the Dodgers. So, I, and I'm not saying he should be the closer. I'm just saying that you, you, you need to add depth. And if you want to go, if you want Emmanuel Class A in part of a, a trade, perhaps. Right, I was going to say, what about it, the trade route? Because right? Bruce Levine says you, they are interested in Class A from the saves you, leader the last right. two years. You want to go that route? I'm open to that. But you're going to have to give up a lot. Well, the thing is, is the Cubs do have a lot. I don't know where Alexander Canario fits on this roster going into 2024. Even right now, unless, and that's with the idea of bringing Bellinger back. Now, if Bellinger is not brought back, then I guess Canario perhaps could have an increased role. But theoretically, right now, the way that I'm thinking, I, I think Bellinger is going to be here. So that's kind of like a wait-and-see thing. But at this point, your outfield is pretty full, and I don't know where Canario fits. So you want to trade him and some other – maybe you probably have to send at least one or two other guys because Class A is young. He is a closer. You know how much it costs for a reliever. Fine. I'm I'm – I feel better about going that route than giving Josh Hader a bunch of money. So, it, considering how the organization sits right now and how they've already basically like basically said that they're not going all in for the World Series in 2024. So, that's that's the way I see it. I I see one veteran reliever at least to add depth. Alzale going into next year as your closer with Merriweather as your setup guy and Almonte and Lighter as long as you and Lighter Jr., as long as you don't use him every single day, you got Luke Little, You, some other guy, maybe a Bailey Horn, which, again, that's I'm not even saying that that's even good enough, but I'm saying that's a nice base. And if you add, if you add another veteran reliever or two, you're probably at least better off on the depth side. And Because to, to me, that was the reason that they really fell apart at the end of the year was their offense and the lack of depth on, in the bullpen. I would love to know what Craig Council thinks of the guys that he saw on the other side, right? Like, what does he think of Al Zelai as his closer? What does he think of the guys that pitched against the Brewers last year? Uh, Niren points out that they need to have more of the young guys come up. They, they do. Like, mm -hmm. some, some of the guys that have been in the organization have come up, haven't done well in reliever roles. But is Assad going to be a reliever or a starter this year? How would he be used by Craig it's Council another guy this that, season? I, that I didn't even mention. Right? So, like... There's different roles, and how will Council want to use those? Because if he's thought of as anything, he's kind of a bullpen genius the way he's used the bullpen. It, now, he's yeah, had what? good arms, too. He's had good arms. So the, the one thing I would caution about the Class A trade is, number one, they can still move him at the trade deadline and get just as big a haul because people will always overpay for a great closer at the trade deadline, right? And, and why – wave the flag if you're Cleveland right now and say, here's, here's mm -hmm. one of the best closers in baseball. We don't need them this season. They might as well wait and see where they are in the division for a little while before they – otherwise you're going to have to overpay now to get him. And his velocity was down a tick last year. And he's had the most saves the last two years. At some point, those relievers generally, even though he's only 25, could be impacted by that. Be careful how big the big the payback is to get a guy who yeah, maybe it's nothing. Yeah. yeah. But you got to at least consider it in the back of your head because A is a reliever. Mm -hmm. And why are they relievers generally? Because they're not good enough to be starters. <laughs> they don't have enough pitches to be major league well, starters and do it could, all the time. I, I, I think one of I think one of the things you need to to think about too with bullpens and where the Cubs are at with their bullpen is the roster limits. You have 13 pitchers, so right now it's five starters, eight relievers. Um, they have five guys on that roster right now, which is uh, Adbert Alzali, Mark Letter Jr., Julian Merriweather, Drew Smiley, and Yancy Almonte, who all, I guess at the moment, feel like they would be on that opening day roster, all of them without options. Unless um, somebody, knock on you know, wood, gets hurt in gets spring hurt training, which or is always if someone, you know, whatever, a DFA a or thing. something. But so you have five guys there that have no options. So throughout the season – um, you can't option them down as easily as you can younger players. If you add another veteran reliever without options, that takes up another spot of a guy that you can't uh, you can't be optioning up and down um, as easily. And 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 we've again we've seen the injuries and in, in, in bullpens and how it kind of takes its toll. And you know being able to put the guys on the on the injured list, um, you know that you know that 
a lot of that help have it works itself out, I guess. But without the ability to bring in fresh arms up from Triple A and option a guy down, um, that just limits some of your flexibility. So I, I Class A has options remaining. I would be. I find it hard to believe that the Cubs would be optioning, they, like using him as one of those guys they option up and down. Um, but yeah, so like the more spots you 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 take with veteran relievers, the less spots you have and the less flexibility you have with some of those guys. Whether it's a Luke Little or I mean Michael Rucker comes up and 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 does some mop up duty in, in bullpen a, a couple days and then gets sent back. Like whatever it is, whoever it is, taking up another roster spot with a guy, a veteran, as good as that veteran might be towards the bullpen. You, you're limiting some of your flexibility, so you also have to be careful in that sense that you're not you, – you can't overload your bullpen with guys without options. Like you, you just can't in this day and age with the roster limits, with you know the amount of days option play, players have yeah. to be down in, in the minor leagues. You can't overload your bullpen with guys that you can't be flexible with. So I think that, that's another wrinkle in creating this bullpen that – Jed and Carter and all those guys in the front office are are absolutely considering because if they they could go out and sign David Robertson and, and some of these other guys, but if you have eight guys on your bullpen that are you know no options, then you have to you have to in some way hope they can last the entire one sixty two or hope if they get hurt um, the injury is not too severe right, right? It's because you can't you don't have that flexibility so that's definitely just something that um, another thing they have to juggle with with when they're creating. Um, you know, this bullpen that they are hoping needs improving. That, yeah, needs improving for sure. And again, I, I mentioned Class A. He's he does have options, but it's just is he someone that is going to be shuttling back and forth between Iowa? I I don't see it if he was someone the Cubs were going to go. Uh, if, the, if he's someone the Cubs are bringing in, I don't see him as a guy that's shuttling back and forth unless the struggles are real, which is a different problem in itself. Which is what all would be. The worst case scenario, yeah, right? For sure. And you've given uh, like up that, prospects for a guy that's struggling yeah, in his back yeah, at Iowa. That's, that's what, a different problem. That's what I all. was going to say in relation to what Luke said about Class A and the risk, you can also flip that on Josh Hader too. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. yes, he's been great his entire career, and Craig Council would know how to use him because he used him in Milwaukee, but he is getting older, right? And as we've seen with. I think Craig Kimbrell is a great example. Like his first year and a half with the Cubs was not great. And I I know Hater is significantly younger than Craig Kimbrell was when he came to the Cubs, but I'm just saying like it goes back to what you were saying, Luke, about how they are a toss up sometimes. And even a guy like him can be a toss up. So when it comes to the risk, it just goes back to what we say all the time about free agents, trades, whatever. There's a risk in every single one of them. So <laughs> Which one is a bigger risk? I think giving all that money to someone like Josh Hader instead of investing that money into someone else that could impact your roster every single day is a bigger risk instead of trading for Class A, who is, would be under control, he's younger, whatever. I'm sure the Pitch Lab can help him get back to maybe wherever he was with Cleveland at his peak. I believe in that. So that's that's how I feel about that that entire scenario but also another my other point ryan you mentioned drew smiley mm -hmm. i forgot to mention and, and when you minced you you mentioned the, the the ass man i didn't even mention jordan wicks because i still think they're going to go get like another veteran pitcher to be in the rotation and so that would probably bump jordan wicks into the bullpen as well to be probably your long reliever right and so that that also creates depth i don't I'm not sure. And if, Council's big on Wes Neske. He, he was talking about him at true. camp. Like, wow, really excited to see what he might be this so that, year. So they have some guys, especially if they sign a, or trade for another starting pitcher. They have some guys. Wes Neske had his ups and downs. Obviously got cooked by left-handed pitching. Jordan Wicks has only spent a month in, the, in major leagues. Will he transition to be able to do this for an entire year? I don't know. Luke Little, same thing. A month in the major leagues and honestly only pitched in low leverage situations thanks to David Ross. Can he be that guy? Well, the Cubs sure hope he will because I believe that they're going to go into next season hoping that he becomes a mainstay in the bullpen and we're talking about him being one of our best relievers ever in five years. That's what I hope, right? On top of Merriweather, on top of Azale, who has, you know, the question about Azale is can he do what he did last year for another year? Merriweather, 
never really good anywhere else except last year with the Cubs. Can he put t- put it together for another season? There's a, there's questions all over the bullpen because there just isn't a lot of guys who have been doing it for years and years and years. The closest person to that, maybe, maybe, is Al Monte. You know who else you for- forgot? Keegan Thompson. Who's oh, going to yeah. be this year's Keegan Thompson from 22? Who's going to be this year's Merriweather from 23? Right. Like, who is the guy they're going to find and unlock that can be an absolute weapon? The one I, I do think it's the hardest part of building your roster is figuring out the bullpen. Mm. Unless you've got Mariano Rivera, bullpen's the hardest thing to figure out. The one thing that makes you feel okay about it is the Cubs have had varied success at it in finding some guys out of nowhere. And at the trade deadline, if your team's good enough... You can always go add. You can Mm -hmm. always really mix up. Like a bullpen that struggles in the first half can be a total strength in the second half depending on who you add at the trade deadline. That said, last year showed you one thing. Those games in April and May are just as important as the games at the end. So you got to have enough guys that you're successful in the first half of the season. You can't just say, well, give counsel the first half of the season to figure out the bullpen because those could be critical games that you're just giving away. If you don't have the right depth or the right yep. combination. And as we saw last year, roles changed pretty quickly, right? Very like quickly, they went into la- they went into last year with Fulmer and Boxberger as like the back end guys and that was completely different by the end of the year. So it's different it, by like May. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, yeah. But I'm just it saying it just didn't work as well last year. The finding right. guys off the scrap heap didn't work as well right. last year other than Merriweather. Right. This is the I think this is the year where we do see, like what Niren has been saying in the chat, I think this is the year where we do see some of these relievers that have been talked about on, in the system come up and get an opportunity to make an impact on this team. And I think Luke Little is the biggest one of them. And I don't know how the Cubs see him in terms of you know his role in the bullpen. I, I see it as, at least in the start, middle reliever, Sixth, seventh inning, somewhere in that range. The fact that he can throw high heat and as a left-handed pitcher, that's pretty valuable, right? But again, as we saw, you know, we were I, I know I was high on Jeremiah Estrada. I was high on some other guys that didn't work out, right? So that's why you still gotta sign, in my opinion, at least one veteran reliever reliever who has proved to be able to do something over the years. So, you know, Robert Stevenson, whatever. Like I I think it is key that they need to at least get one. And I'm okay with giving a two-year deal to like someone like that, two- or three-year deal to someone like that, yeah. rather than tra- or signing Josh Hader and you know investing all that money. I don't need into, to give into, five. Into, right. Uh, so. Nir- Niren's out on Cam Sanders. He says he walks more than seniors at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't great. In, well, I mean, me and Ryan were at the game in Iowa whenever he just got lit up. Yeah. Uh, I want to believe in the guy because his dad's super cool dude who is, you know, retweeted us a bunch of times in, on Twitter. But, you know, I got it to him. I, yeah. I, there's more than just Cam Sanders down there. So, yeah. you know, we, they, again, I think that we'll see some guys get an opportunity and, you know, we'll sit here and debate whether this guy, or this guy can be part of the future. But it it is part of the process of – building that quote-unquote next great Cubs team you got you got to be able to develop guys right you can't just buy them all so I do believe in what council can do with a bullpen so as long as they find him the arms that have potential I believe he'll be able to figure out how to use them correctly Uh, speaking of using things correctly Cody uses Circa Sportsbook and that's why he constantly has new Jordans every other week not wearing them today but that's because it's crappy outside yeah, yesterday on the show I said Steelers plus 10, and that was a brutal beat considering they couldn't tackle a guy in the final five minutes, but whatever. Uh, Bucks money line, I didn't give it out, but I took Bucks money line against the Eagles last night, the easiest underdog win of the year. All on Sp- Circus Sportsbook. Uh, you know, I, I always give the, the three things, all right? The three things I love about this sportsbook. The tight money line splits is number one. Games will strive to be minus 110 split on Circus Sportsbook. On Circus Sports menu, unlike other sports books, which may use minus 115 or minus 120, Circus Sports keeps as little money as possible on large market bets, especially compared to other books. They actually 
encourage bettors to download and explore all sport sports betting apps available to compare the lines from each sports book with theirs. And because they don't they don't limit players based on their winnings, and that's why they they ask they they allow or they encourage people to do that. And uh, you see for yourself just how much better circuit is from everyone else. Uh, and then again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Like the fact that they don't use chat chatbots is the best. I can't stand talking to chatbots. They need to get rid of chatbots. Like cancel them. Should be illegal. Should be illegal, right? <laughs> All aspects of their app are being run by the same team that runs the main Circa Sportsbook at Circa Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. So download the Circa Sports Illinois app at circasports.com slash Illinois dash app to sign up today. Also be on the lookout for Circa events, watch parties, and tailgates. If you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1-800-GAMBLER, text G-A-M-B to 833-234, or visit areyoureallywinning.com. Hey, guys, Midtown Athletic Club, four Chicagoland locations, Palatine in the northwest burbs, Bannockburn in the north shore, Willowbrook in the southwest suburbs, and Midtown Athletic Club and Hotel in the middle of Bucktown and Lincoln Park. Remember, Midtown Palatine launched their multi-million dollar transformation of the club, which is going to be complete here early in 2024. You can get favorable rates right now. Uh, they've got deals going so far uh, early in the season here. Uh, make sure that you know, understand this. They've got something for everybody. It doesn't matter where you're signing up or where you live, whether you're single, whether you've got a family with kids, maybe you're just making lifestyle changes for the new year. They've got something for everybody. It's the nicest fitness club I've ever walked into. It's incredible. They have great features. They've got super luxury locker rooms, outdoor, indoor, pools, hot tubs, you name it. They've got yoga. They've got a sauna. They've got boxing. They've got cycling, cross training, group exercise, and the best tennis courts anywhere. Best programming in the sport as well. Midtown has indoor and outdoor tennis, pickleball, paddleball, USTA, professional quality all the way. Head over to midtown.com slash CHGO to find out more and a tour the Midtown Athletic Club near you. They're waiving at three of the locations, they are waiving the initiation fee this month. So oh, that's something to look into. I know huge. the Peloton is one of those. That's huge. So uh, have we made Barb mad? Is Barb, Barb not, not here? here. Barb, th- Barb's not Barb, in the Barb, she's not here. Wellness check. Somebody check on Barb. Where's Barb? She might be upset that Cody yelled at her yesterday. Well, so. sometimes you just got to be told, like, to calm down. It's tough love. It is tough um, love. And I did mention Barb, that, we, yeah. that we love Barb. Barb yeah. is, Barb, come back. you know, she's here every day. She's just like, you know, <laughs> evil wax. He's here every day. Gary, speaking Gary, of people here every day, Gary said, are you guys not worried about how many players you can't option next year? Gary must have fallen asleep because I believe I talked Gary about Gary missed that the first like, segment of the show. Yeah. You I think spent I like five minutes yeah, on talking about Come on, how Gary. many guys they can option. Rewind after the show's <laughs> over, Gary. That was like a special um, segment just for Gary. It was a just super for chat Gary. Too. Oh, do we have a super chat? Did I miss it? Super, super chat. Super chat. Mitch yeah. Phil 98. was back $5. in Illinois two days ago with minus 30 degree wind chill temps. Glad to be back in my 40 degree South Carolina weather. Ooh. Way to I rub would, it in, Mitch. Yeah. I would do a lot of things for 40 degrees right now. But thank oh, you for yeah. the super chat. I won't get into the I specifics. bet he goes to Myrtle Beach. I've never been to Myrtle Beach. It's nice. I'd love to go it's there. Nice. Yeah. I've heard good things about it. I've never been it's there It's the last either, place uh, before COVID that I vacationed. Oh. Yeah. Nice. Just I was in Cancun. It was one of those where, like, COVID. where do you want to go? Let's find a Marriott that we can stay at for free. And then it was like, you ever been to Myrtle Beach? No, no. Let's go for three days. It was nice. There you go. You know what I had there? Oh, God. Crab. I didn't have crab. I did have some good seafood there. Um, the best thing I ate there, though, it's there was a, a restaurant dessert. called, I believe, the Blueberry Cafe in Myrtle oh, Beach. Yep, here we go. <laughs> they slice a blueberry muffin. Oh, okay. <laughs> lather it in butter and fry it or grill. They grill it like a grilled cheese. So it's like a grilled blueberry, hot blueberry muffin. Okay. Legit. Let me tell you. Okay. Something about Luke Stuckmeyer and his breakfast Ooh. and dessert. Yeah, I think it's called the Blueberry Cafe. He loves he does, honestly, we should start the CH. Like, it should be called CHGO Eats. I'm not going to say it's magical, Mitch. But yeah, we should do Eats. CHGO Eats, like, hosted by me and Luke. I mean, we would just sit here and talk about food for hours. If you Mitch, you, Mitch, Mitch says it's it's overrated. I'm not saying it's not overrated. I was there for three days, but have you tried? Let me see if it is the Blueberry Cafe. <laughs> blueberry. There we go. Blueberry Hill Cafe. My, Mike Talkman can no, wait. No, that's Lagrange. We gotta Talkman. talk about Mike Talkman. Blueberry Cafe. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> 
Northside says Myrtle. South Carolina is a dump. <laughs> Damn. Jeez. I've never been. I can't. I can't say. It's the Blueberry Hill Breakfast there. Cafe. Oh, okay. Maybe. There you go. Can't say that. No, maybe go it's there. Just blueberries. Go there, Mitch. Blue. It's the blue. Um, here it is. This is going to be it. Blueberries Grill. <laughs> I think that might be it. I'm not totally sure. It's something with blueberries. It's legit. It's by the Marriott. Anyways. Uh, the more you know. All right. So we had, we had a chance to sit down with some Cubs players at Cubs convention. Um, As in we, it was you, Ryan, and Jared. Jared and, and Ryan kind of switched out, and they kind of rotated us in. They brought some guys in to talk to us. Um, Mike Talkman was one of them. And we mentioned, you know, where does he fit on this team? We talked a lot of stuff with him. But, of course, uh, we had to start the conversation with an obvious question in my mind. So here's, here is part one of our interview with, uh, for lack of a better term, the Palatine Pounder. Here with Cubs outfielder Mike Talkman, And, obviously, if you had to mention 2023, you don't start that conversation until you mention the catch. Right? Like, I mean, I, I know it's probably just one play in your in your major league career but in the moment what did the catch against the cardinals feel like um i mean in the moment it was just like we won yeah you know um i think that that was a stretch during the season where there was there was a lot of confidence in the clubhouse but i know there was a lot of uncertainty about uh what we were planning on doing um what the decision makers were sort of planning on doing and, um, you know, the group that we had, you know, we, 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 we wanted to be together and we wanted to add to it. Um, you know, we felt like we were really starting to play our best ball and we knew that that stretch meant a lot. So, um, you know, I, I don't know at that time, just exactly how many games in a row we were kind of at in terms of, you know, the win loss stuff, but we knew we were playing good ball and just to keep that going, you know, sort of right at that critical decision-making time, um, it felt good. It just felt good to keep it going, keep the momentum going, because we felt really good about where we were at. And you know you have it off the bat, or do, are you? You know, um, the ball was kind of traveling weird uh, that whole series. It was, it was like 100 degrees with like 80% humidity every day. Um, so the ball was doing some weird stuff. I did not think, being dead center, I didn't think just where the pitch was and the swing you put on it that it was going to, you know, potentially go out, but uh, the ball just kept carrying. So, um, you know, probably not the best initial read by me, but I'm just, you know, luckily I was able to get a glove on it. And it seems like the kind of ball that it, as you're reading it, you have to adjust your, you know, your approach to be able to get to it. What's the point where you realized this is going all the way to the wall? I need to be, I need to be there for it. Um. Probably around when you hit the warning track because, you know, that's sort of that uh, the alarm bells go off in your brain. It's like, I'm on the track. This is how much room I now have. So, um, you know, that's sort of those on the fly calculations start kind of coming into play. Like I have this many steps and then I got to jump and it is what it is. And, you you know, you try to sneak a peek if you can or feel it a little bit. But, um, you know, definitely when you hit the warning track, it's like, okay. This is the this is the area where I have to be at least aware of of the fence. And that that moment for the team is a big moment on the season. But for you personally, as you think back on your 2023 season, where does that rank in just you know personal? This is my favorite highlight of the year. Or how do you how do you look back on that? Um, it's up there. You know, um, I, I'm you know, extremely fortunate to, uh, you know, have gotten some of the opportunities that I've gotten in my career. So I try to be, um, you know, just thankful for all of, for, for whatever happens, you know, um, good or bad, uh, and that, that particular situation, I was, I was just really happy to, that I was able to, you know, make a play for the team that contributed to a win. Um, you know, that's what I've tried to, that's the kind of player that I've tried to be is just someone who's willing to do whatever he needs to do to help the team win. Multiple gold glove winners for the team last year. Um, obviously defense was a huge focal point in the off season. I think Jed Hoyard said it wasn't their game plan going into the off season, but it just sort of 
the door open and they were like, we can get much better defensively by doing this. How much of a focus was put on that in spring training, just uh, whether it was the center fielder, the third baseman, the first baseman. We talked to Nick Madrigal about learning a new position, and I thought what he did was incredible. Yeah, um, you know, I think something – I, I think teams, if you if you look at the teams that are standing at the end of the year, they take care of the baseball. And, um, you know, the, in my opinion, the, on, the only absolute we have in baseball is that you get 27 outs. And having it and, and creating outs when there should be outs is, um, I think, kind of like a necessity to be a good team. It makes your pitching better. It takes pressure off the offense. It takes pressure off the bullpen. Uh, creates uh, trust and uh, the momentum created from, you know, exceptional defensive plays can carry out through other parts of the game as well. So, um, you know, that was that was definitely a um, foundational aspect of our team last year, and I expect it to be um, this year as well. And on the other side of the ball, you you contributed significantly on offense and. And we saw this year you had, I think, the lowest strikeout rate of your career, the the best walk rate of your career. One of, at the plate, one of the best seasons you've had so far. And I, I know I've seen in the locker room where you have a lot of conversations with people about hitting. It seems like you're talking about hitting quite a bit. Um, when you when you are having those those conversations, are you approaching guys as like kind of sounding boards for ideas? And how much do you kind of take things from them that you might apply to your own plate appearances? Um so interesting because there's so much theory about hitting and what is valuable in hitting and different things evaluate things different ways um but in order to i think be consistently successful it's it's like you have to take all of that information and like funnel it down to an extremely extremely simple thing which is i have to get a good pitch to hit I have to be ready for a good pitch first and foremost. I have to recognize that that's a good pitch to hit, and I have to put the, the barrel, the bat, on the ball. And um, everything else sort of funnels down to that. So I think that, like, I love talking hitting, but I think it can get a little bit overcomplicated sometimes. And I'll I'll talk hitting till the cows come home because I'm just extremely passionate about it. But um, I think that knowing yourself and being able to self-evaluate allows you to funnel the right information into into uh into your game plan so sometimes it may just be out of interest sake right like you're just interested in what somebody else has seen or you're always thinking all right if i if i talk to dansby about his at bats last night he can tell me and it might be able to help me with something i'm looking forward to putting into my approach for tonight is is it sometimes a little bit of each just like out of yeah, and cur- I think curiosity, I guess is the word. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And 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 being able to understand what good players, what makes them tick, I think is an extremely valuable thing. Um, I mean, it's no different than you know, I get probably in the business world. Like, why is this person successful in business? Why is this person successful in what they do? Um, so I think there's value there. Um, and honestly, a lot of times it's it's it can be therapeutic just to talking to someone but you're really talking to yourself because you're talking through your thought process and sometimes you'll say something and you're like why am i thinking that or you'll say something and be like oh like i did i wasn't putting enough importance on that and now that i've said it out loud i've recommitted myself to it so um i think there's just value in in open communication with your teammates and you know, sometimes a guy will say something, and and he'll and he'll feel really bad about what he's doing. He'll talk it out, and it's like, man, I don't see that at all. This is what I see, and it can give a different perspective on that because you're probably never as you're probably never going as good as you think you are when you're going good, or you're never as bad as you think you are when you're going bad. You're always gonna kind of work your way back to that middle, and sometimes just talking that out is is really really valuable. Who do you? Use as a sounding board. That I, if I was a Cubs pitcher coming up in the farm system or where, or a new player coming to the team, I would look at Kyle Hendricks and say, "That's a guy I need to talk to." 
because you can just see the cerebral side of the game and the success that he's had. Uh, do you feel like there are a lot of guys on this team that can offer something to somebody, whether it's a young player or yourself or, or, or another veteran that might be just looking for an advantage one day? Um, sure. I mean, they're kind of, kind of what I, I talked about before. There's a lot of, there's a, there's, there's an endless amount of information right now. Um, but some things about like between the white lines, you got to get outs and you got to score runs. You got to keep the other team from scoring and you have to score. And, um, just how the breakdowns would go. Um, the, the, the days that I would play out hit in the first group and I'd hit with, uh, the catcher, the catcher would always hit in the first group. Cause then he has to go do a lot of stuff. And a lot of times that was Jan and I would watch Jan and he would always take a round or two. And it's like, I know exactly what he's trying to do in this round. He's trying to create a swing that can produce a middle of the field line drive with not a lot of effort. And this is his game winner swing. This is his, we need a hit. We need a single, not a home run or a walk or a strikeout or a three true out. We need a single to win the game. And he practices it every single day. And if you look at his late game numbers last year, they were phenomenal. They were phenomenal. So it's like, well, this person has a really intentional practice every day. We didn't even really need to talk about it. We talked about it after I noticed it. And then I was thinking at the end of the year, you know, we had a lot of young guys up and he had a huge hit for us against Atlanta. And I went over to John Maley, who's going to be with us in the big leagues this year. Um, who's also a phenomenal hitting coach. Um, all our hitting coaches are phenomenal. Um, but he said, I was like, I was like, make sure these young guys know that, that Jan just practices that he practices that every single day. And that's, that's a guy who has a ring. That's a guy who's played in multiple world series. That's a, that's a winning player who's had a long, successful career and he keeps producing because of his intentional practice. So that's part one. I think it's awesome where he's talking about that story at the end about Jan Gomes. Like we talked about his value Gomes and how good he was for the team last year probably better than anybody expected but that shows you the type of stuff that he's doing that could also potentially impact the team if 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 young players are willing to soak it in yeah and like you look at Mike talking like he's not a young player or anything nope. right he's 32 years old like maybe even going on 33 like he's he's had years in the league some success in the league right with New York uh, so he's not a young player but even he's picking up and and watching Jan Gomes, a guy who's well respected in that clubhouse, and I, I, I would assume around the league, um, you know, a, a longtime vet, World Series champion, as he mentioned, um, and he, just just the little things, right? Like BP mm -hmm. before a game, and you know, everyone's watching. Like, you go to a ballpark, especially if you get there for BP, right? You get there before the game, gates open, you can watch guys take BP. Um, you're watching the home runs, right? Like I remember when Christopher Morel first came up, and all we, we were in awe of some of the shots he was taking. Um, his first BP, like hitting off the scoreboard. Like th those were the cool things you're watching out for. And you, when you do that, you miss things like Jan Gomes just getting reps on, I need, like you said, I, I, need, I need this hit. We need this, this game-winning hit. I just need to put the ball in play and try to get a single. Don't need to hit a home run. And when you're not looking for it, you miss that. But guys like Mike Talkman, um, you know, a guy that understands that at this level sees that and like he said he goes up to to hitting coach and tells him make sure these young guys are watching and they know this because it, that those little things go a long way towards helping young players be longtime big leaguers like Jan Gomes is right like Mike Talkman is not a longtime big leaguer he played in Korea uh, in 2022 right um, so he's even still trying to pick up on things and talking not just Jan Gomes but other guys in the clubhouse about how about about just different ways that they've had success and sustainable success in the big league. So, you know, Jan Gomes may not be the most important offensive player to this team. He may not end up with a WRC plus above 100 um, any year, right? But he's doing the little things that, as we saw for a lot of 2023, pay off when he needs when it when, when they need him to you know when they need it to pay off. He's doing those little things behind the scenes that no one notices, but when it comes down to to come to coming through, Jan Gomes did that a lot this last season, and that's that type of pregame work is is important. So I think 
Talkman going and pointing out to John Malley and telling him, talk to the hitters about this, the young guys, I think that's hugely important too. I just think Talkman and Gomes are just like good veteran presence for young dudes. And sure, Gomes has more a much longer major league uh, track record. Um, but, you know, I think Talkman's, you know, his – Major League career hasn't exactly been linear either. So he's gone through the ups and downs. Had to go to Korea because mm-hmm. he couldn't find a role with, you know, I, his best year before last year was probably the Yankees 2019 and just went through, you know, couldn't find a team that was going to, you know, give him a chance, right? And so he's been through the ups and downs of what it's like to be a major leaguer. And so I I think that those two can be really beneficial for a lot of young guys, you know, for, in Talkman's case – Maybe a guy like PCA, Canario, like these outfielders. And then, obviously, I think Jan Gomes' experience and and knowledge can be especially beneficial for a guy like Miguel Amaya, who mm-hmm. we're hoping going into 2024 takes a big step and, you know, becomes that next catcher. Because I as, mu- as good as Jan Gomes was last year, I mean, he's also going to be 37 next season. Like you, you need Miguel Amaya to really take control of that of that position. I th- I still think going into the year they'll probably be fifty fifty in terms of how many games they start. But I think if if you ask the Cubs, they really want Amaya to take that step. So hopefully, you know, Jan Gomes has made a huge impact on Amaya already. And but no, I, I love the story that Talkman told. Yeah, I, related I, to I, him. and I like it. Just kind of goes to. Like, I think it's something that a lot of people think, right? You hear Jan Gomes talk. You hear people talk about Jan Gomes. Like, the dude's got a future in coaching, potentially managing, right? Like, the, like the, the guy's mind for the game is so great. And, again, like, you, you don't last as long as he has in the big leagues. Obviously without talent, but without understanding the game at this level. Uh, and so I think there's a future in coaching for Jan Gomes whenever he decides to hang up the cleats because – uh, of things like this, right? Just the little things that he can provide to, to young guys, whether that's as a veteran player or even as a coach. There might be for Talkman too. I mean, there's a guy who was, uh, you know, as Cody mentioned, hasn't been linear, but he's able to fine-tune things and see things around the ballpark that might help him, might help somebody else, and he's just paying attention. You know, he, he's focused, but he's, he's also paying attention. Yeah. Now, this I, is... I also was going to say, I also... To the beginning of the Mike Talkman thing, I when he mentions the uh, when you're talking about the catch uh-huh. in St. Louis, and he mentioned like off the bat, like he didn't think it. Yeah, was he didn't think good. his read was very good. That was literally watching that. I thought it was a fly out to like mid center, maybe deep center. Off the bat, I felt the same way. I had no inclination that that was, it was a going night. to be a home run. It was like ninety something yeah, degrees, it was real muggy humidity. But like, that's another thing where it's like listening to Mike Talkman, like. Obviously, we, we all watched the catch. We've, we've read I mean, read the stories, written the stories, whatever. Um, but hearing him kind of talk through the whole process is also just a cool getting inside the mind of him in that moment and making, you know, what was it, number three? MLB rated, uh, ranked at number three on plays of 2023 the other it's day. It's one of the yeah, greatest catches. Wise. It's yeah. one of the greatest catches in Cubs history. People yeah. will talk about it's it for huge. years to come. I mean, when, like, the, the summer of Talkman bit, like, the joke, like, that's a play that – like, that's part of the joke at this point now. Like, when in 10 years, when you look back at random, like, when, you know, you're sitting around with your buddies like Corey and Brennan were, like, two weeks ago when nothing was happening, you're talking about random Cubs, Mike Topman will be one of those guys one day. Well, we'll see how he impacts mm-hmm. the team mm-hmm. this year. Could be another big impact. This is where uh, we will pause for our podcast listeners, and the podcast people will hear from our great sponsors. There is more Mike uh, Talkman conversation coming up on the way, and – Really, the Cubs outfield is sort of cemented on both corners, right? Like, Hap has a no-trade clause. Suzuki has a no-trade clause. So you know those two guys are going to get playing time, most likely, in left and right field. But there's a lot of flexibility in the outfield, too. Uh, You have Talkman. You have maybe PCA. You have maybe Canario or another young prospect coming up or a prospect coming up. And, hey, maybe there's even Cody Bellinger. So this is where Jared Willis picks up the conversation at Cubs convention in our conversation and talk with Cubs outfielder Mike Talkman. 
Mike, we're in the we're in the time of year where a lot of the attention is on free agents, trades, the way that you know teams are adding to their rosters and and, and those changes that are happening. So the Cubs we've seen Shota and Managa come to the team. They make this trade with the Dodgers that brings you know a reliever and and a position player. But um, there's also there's always the possibility that there's a move that could happen that would impact your your role with the team. How do you how do you handle that as as you're preparing yourself for the season, knowing that that possibility is is out there? Um. Yeah, I mean, I I suppose that's a possibility. Um. I, I feel as though I demonstrated how I can provide value last year. And um, I did. I wasn't on the team for the first six weeks of the year last year. And I felt like I still was able to contribute to the team at different parts in the year. So how the season start is not how the season's going to be at the All-Star break or post-All-Star break or trade deadline or whatever it is. So it would be much better for me to focus on the things that I can control, which is making sure my body feels good, making sure that I'm prepared for a 162 game stretch plus postseason, which is what we're all, you know, trying to accomplish. And, you know, things like that over that long of a stretch, things, opportunities are going to present themselves and things are going to take care of, are going to be taken care of the way that they should be. So when you weren't there on opening day, is that exactly how you were thinking or were you disappointed and using it as motivation? I mean, you always want to be in the big leagues. And I felt like coming back from playing overseas, it was probably the best thing for me. Um, just to, I was, I was just, and I, I love my time in Korea. My teammates were awesome. It was an amazing experience, but because of the language barrier, I missed just chopping it up with the guys. So I was like, you know, I'm going to go somewhere I'm I'm close to home. I've I've only ever been on the East Coast or the West Coast, so I'm close to home, and I'm back. And I love chopping it up with the guys in the clubhouse. So I was just I was just looking forward to playing some baseball. Um, you know, I was very I was very surprised when I got called up because, you know, I try not to focus on what's going on uh, up there and and watch the roster and see what's going on because I, it it just kind of takes away from what you're trying to do. Um. So you always want to be in the big leagues, but, you know, things have a way of taking care of themselves. Speaking of chopping it up, are you a bear? I mean, are you a Bears fan? I am. All right. So what are they going to do? Like, uh, this is, what's what's like, your this take is, on it? I've, I, I've <laughs> said on our podcast that I think Jed has, Jed Hoyer has a huge job right now because you guys seem like you're ready to jump off the platform and move forward. And so it's like a critical time and could be a critical time in Cubs history for what happens now, next year, last off season, uh, whether it's development of players, whatever. But obviously Ryan Poles has like the moment in sure. all of Chicago sports right now. Like, yeah. Um, it seems as though he's done a pretty good job <laughs> yeah. so far, uh -huh. you know, agreed. Um, so, so you'd like to trust he, it's, it seems as though he's probably earned some trust on the decision-making side. Um, he's going to do whatever he does. So it's kind of like, you just wait and see, but I, I hear you, man. I mean, it's, I've probably gone back and forth on it just as much as everybody else has. That's a fan of the team. And, you know, there's no denying that, you know, Justin Fields is an incredible athlete and an incredible player. And, you know, he's made some um, seemingly he's made some strides as a quarterback that, that, you know, the, t the way the team was playing in the second half of the season, I was like, man, like that's, if, if September goes a little bit differently, it's a playoff team and we're getting ready for a game on Sunday, you know? So, um, I, I, I don't envy, I don't envy that job this off season. I'll put it that way. And, you know, whatever he does is, is, you know, kind of whatever he does. That's the life of a Bears fan, man. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's where I feel like most of us are. Yeah. You know? We're all kind of ask me one day and, and I'll have one opinion and a different day. I've, I've changed my mind. But starting a season with losing to the Packers and ending a season with losing to the Packers, it's tough. It's, yeah. it's about as bad as it gets. It's tough. It's tough. Um, you know, I have some friends that are Packers fans and then, you know, I, I don't know, but I, I think, 
I think the division's winnable next year. And, you know, I know that, um, you know, they're deciding to go a different direction uh, with the offensive coordinator. And, and, you know, it's a very offensive league. The NFL is a very offensive league. And, you know, it seems as though, you know, the team has a playoff caliber defense and continue to develop the offense. Um, I think the division is, you know, there for the taking. So I'm excited. You're pro Arlington Park or you're pro staying somewhere downtown or Waukegan? I, you know, I drive by every single day. I drive by Arlington every single day. So it was incredible. It was, it was insane to watch it come down the way that it did. And like, you know, you drive by one day and there's just the next day, there's a huge section gone. Um, it's like a mile and a half from my house. So like, if I was being like, if I was like, you know, <laughs> the value of my house. That's right. I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking Arlington, but you know, there's a, there's a, there's a pizza place that's like kitty corner to Arlington racetrack. And I know they want to build the whole area. It's the best pizza place in Arlington Heights. So it's like, is that Wayne's Wayne's? Yeah. Wayne's is legit. Wayne's is legit. Thin crust legit. I'm telling you double decker. Yeah. I, uh, I'm a big fan of Wayne's. Yeah. So if, if, if you come to Arlington, you can't mess with Wayne's. That's my big take on it. Very nice. I'm with that. Hey, thanks for your time. We appreciate it. Hopefully, we'll run into you throughout the season, and uh, hopefully, we'll run into you in the postseason as well when the Bears will be getting ready for their midseason run. There you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> dead, bro. That, but he's the, every Bears fan, yeah, right? Bears Mike Tocqueville, every Bears, Bears fan. fan. The size, the height. Played quarterback yeah. at Fremd, Just, I believe. And then it was the most, like, not surprising thing to see you chopping it up with him about Arlington Heights. Hey, I didn't. No one up, loves Arlington Heights in this office like you do. I didn't bring up food at all, did I? I didn't you even did mention you food. But you knew exactly. But, well, what he as was soon as he said about. there's a pizza place by Arlington Park, I'm like, not everybody knows about Wayne's. This guy's a local. Exactly. This guy's local. <laughs> Which pizza place? He I've was known about. the delivery guy at Wayne's since I was a little kid. No, him. George, him, my guy. I need George, to go to this Wayne's. My place. buddy George. Great thin crust. Him Great talking thin about crust. tiny little. I mean, a tiny place. Him talking about. Bears Packers. Yeah, that's that's the really, most relatable yeah. thing. That ever. is all just of the us. size, right? He's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's life is a Bears fan. Like that. Life is a Bears fan. If you if you look at it and think that like pro athletes are much different than you, you oh, just yeah. need to look at that clip and be like, no, when it comes to Bears Packers, we are all the exact same people. However, I wish she just would have gave us a little spice. Like a little you bit. You should have asked him like Caleb Williams or Justin Fields. Like I, I, I want to know what, it, like, who does he want? You know, Jay but, Cutler. Jay Cutler says Fields. Yeah, but even that, Jay you know, Cutler's even, pretty crazy. Even his answer to Luke's <laughs> question was like, "That's how a lot of people feel." Like flip flopping yeah. back and like, don't know. Exactly well, that's how I am. Out, I don't right? know the answer. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know if it's Fields or Williams. Exactly. I don't know. I'm at a point where it's just like, just <laughs> win because I'm tired of watching us lose to the Packers and just be losers in general. Um. So. Oh, Nearon Wayne's is way better than Barnaby's. Yeah, way better than Barnaby's. Um, Wayne's is I, one I'm of those good, little I, I need local, to go to this Wayne's place, all right? Lo, one of those nice little local pizza places. Great thin mm -hmm. crust. I do, like, uh, I do like the beginning of that and talking about, like, the things, like, controlling the things you can control. Mike Talkman. Um, I think that was Jared's question about, you know, that there's moves that could still be made this offseason that might affect – his opportunities and his playing time and yeah I think when you're when you're a player you, you hear a lot of players talk that way that they can't control what Jed and Carter and Tom Ricketts and what the rest of the front office does they can't they, they can only go out and play their best and and earn a spot and 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 show them that they're like earn their belief right that's all they could do uh, and like when you look at again Mike Talkman's journey, right? Like he played again. He played in Korea yeah. a year before he came to the Cubs, and he didn't make the ro the the active roster until Cody Bellinger got went down in mid May. Like he spent six weeks in Triple A after signing with the Cubs. So like you really never know where you know when the next opportunity comes, and if you can just control what you can control, you know, go out there perform produce like that that's the only way he can 
force the front office to do anything, right? Just go and show them that he deserves a spot on the team. So um, I do like the mindset from Mike Talkman, who, you know, I think we've kind of talked about if the Cubs do re-sign Bellinger um, or even like, you know, PCA kind of starts to develop the way they need him to develop. Like Mike Talkman may not have a starting spot on this roster um, going into the season, but I think he proved last year as far as depth, as far as a, a bench bat, as far as, um, a little bit of that veteran leadership, like he can still be, he still has a role on this team, even if that is, you know, as a bench bat, as a, as a fourth outfielder, right? So I, I, I do, but I, again, I do like the mindset of just doing what he needs to do to be his best player, his best person every single day, um, and not worrying about what the decision makers are going to do. Because I think in a way, like that, like just worrying and and concerning yourself with stuff that you can't ha- that you can't control, I do think that can get into your mind a little bit and that's in any walk of life um so for mike talking to have that mindset that he's just gonna go out and do what he needs to do um to prove himself like that i think that's just a i think that's a mindset you want him to have going to this season when there's still question marks about the opportunities that lie ahead of him uh hey more importantly if you're in arlington heights yes i am i am a tortoreses guy for deep dish i like but remember there's multiple tortoreses locations I've so a- there's only one wayne's and you're saying, really? Better than Barnaby's? I'm just telling you. Wayne's is this place where they, they hook some people up. I've even had frozen, uncooked Wayne's, and we take them in a cooler to vacation in Door County with us, and then you pop those babies in the oven. Oh, man, you're sitting around playing a little cards. Okay. At night, you have a nice Wayne's frozen pizza coming out of the oven. <laughs> Wayne's. And what I want to see now, this season, this is my goal, one of them, is... I want a TV commercial. I want Wayne's to have enough money to buy ad space during a Cubs game now instead of the Prevagen ads that we see all over and over. <laughs> what I want what I want to see is, hi, I'm Mike Talkman. If you want good pizza in Arlington Heights, go to Wayne's. Stucky and I say it's the best. Hell yeah. I'd get on top of that. End and of ad. Then they definitely make some more money. That's for them. And maybe we should be hitting them up here on I'm, legitimately, I, I want to go Wayne's. try this place. You're hyping it up as if it's like one of the best, you know, spots in this in this entire area. It's great. It's good thin crust. I wish we had an oven here so I could just bring one of the, mm. you know, uncooked frozens in, Fair. throw it in the oven, and be like, yeah. right after the show, run in. eat it. <laughs> Come on. Yeah. This yeah. is Wayne's baby. Uh, in, to me, uh, you know, you're talk Ryan. You're talking about Talkman's role or whatever. To me, I've, I've this entire offseason, I've thought Talkman would be just like what. Well, a lot of people have compared him to Chris Coughlin on a good team. On a good team, Mike Talkman is like Chris Coughlin was in 2016 for the Cubs. He is a good fourth outfielder that, yeah. on the bench that can come up in late game situations or the middle of the game, whatever, and give you a quality at bat because I think only Ian Happ had a better on base percentage than him last year. He works counts. He goes through some hot streaks too where he got big hits. And I mean, that. That one of the one of the biggest hits he had last year was in Milwaukee that helped helped them get a win on the road. Like he was a quality player that hit was an extreme that no one thought was going to be anything last year. But you can't rely on that again in in, in year two. Uh, and the Cubs aren't going to do that because they have plenty of outfielders. But he he's a very quality bench bat for sure. Like a lot of teams would love to have a guy like him on their bench. Reed Johnson, yeah. Chris Coglin. Yeah, could be that. I that's, mean, like that's that's, that's how a valuable I guy. Like you, I agree. Quality at bats. Like yeah. you got quality at bats from him last year. I mean, year. I, for what last year's team was, the fact that when David Ross put him in the leadoff spot and somehow, some way, the team got super hot <laughs> after that is is telling. But I think with the the fact they'll have more depth uh, in the outfield this coming year, it allows him to be more of a bench guy. Now, opening day, obviously, he'll be on the roster. Obviously, you got to wait and see with this whole Bellinger situation. If if they don't re-sign Bellinger, then they probably start Talkman in center field opening day, and 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 then while we wait for PCA. But I think if you sign Cody Bellinger, Cody Bellinger will be in center field opening day with a mixture of Morell and Bush at first base. That's what I think that will Morell at first base. Yeah, uh, yeah. Morrell or Bush at first base, and and whoever is not at first base will be your DH. That's what I think. Dub says, imagine probably, Mike talking off the bench. Bush at first and Morrell at DH. At yeah, and and, and I and I lean that as well. And and that and that's where we're at right now. 
Mm-hmm. Reese Hoskins still a possibility, but I do think with the addition of Bush, I think Reese Maybe Hoskins less so. is less so now, and Matt Chapman is more so now, as I said yesterday. But I don't know. That I, what do I, I'm not some crystal ball. However, when it comes to sports betting, I am. But when it comes to building this roster, I don't know what's going to happen. But that's if you ask me what my what I think could happen, I think that that's possible now. And then when PCA is ready, you can intertwine Bellinger with those three that I mentioned at first base and also play a little corner outfield on days you want to put get Ian Happ and say Suzuki off their feet. There's a lot of depth. There's a lot to like with that, in my opinion. So, And that goes in with the fact that you can have you also have Mike Tockman, who will probably be like a very solid bench bat. That's good depth, man. A lot of teams would love to have it, in my opinion. 100% agree. Uh, by the way, Tockman and I did discuss off-camera the great Pacero which is great Italian food right in downtown Orlando. Now they talk well. about uh, 1618 West Northwest Highway. Wayne's will open at four o'clock today. Okay. Ask for George and tell him Stucky sent you. <laughs> Thanks for checking out the CHGO Cubs podcast. Hope you appreciated the Mike Talkman interview. More coming up from Cubs convention this week and next week as well. We're back live 1.30 tomorrow. Cold weather or not, we're here for you. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Until then. Fly the W. We all silly like the mayor.